Okay, well, um, are we on? Yep. Great. Okay, well, I want to tell you why I chose the topic. Um, I mean, I've been practicing school psychology and working with, you know, children and adolescents for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And although I have not come in contact with many, many children that I would say are transgender um, or, or gender variant um, children, when I do, I'm not, I haven't always felt well equipped in working with them, um, although I feel like I have tried to support them mm -hmm. as best I can. Um, that's been the population that I probably have felt the least comfortable with um, because I'm just not as knowledgeable about their obstacles as I would like to be. Mm -hmm. So when it came time to um, look at my deliberate practice for this year, I thought that that was really an area of need or for growth for myself. Because I see more and more mm -hmm. transgender and gender variant um, children, even in my elementary school. Um, so I just really kind of wanted to delve into that um, that, that topic. Um, when we're talking to today, I hope that I don't offend anyone with anything that I share. I am no way an expert on this topic, and um, I'm also hoping that we have open discussion, and feel free to ask questions or make comments or share any personal experiences, and of course, I hope that this, everyone feels like this is a safe place to share. Mm -hmm. so. I do have a question. Do you say transgender, and what was the other one that you said? Gender variant, but in, what's when the I say, difference in what? And tra transgender typically is an umbrella term that we use. To I believe it's it's kind of an umbrella term where we say the child's biological sex and their gender identity do not match. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Okay. Um, and I have written a statement over here on the board, and it says, while all young people experience social pressure to conform to social gender norms, transgender youth experience pressure in their core sense of self. And when I was reading a lot of the literature, really, um, I really feel like maybe this information needs to go to teachers, faculty, and staff who work with middle school age children, or maybe even at the age of like 9 through 12 could probably be the area where that's really happening because that's the stage of development where children are really starting to reach puberty mm -hmm. and they're really struggling with what's happening with their body mm -hmm. and it can be very upsetting. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm learning a lot um, and, and I'm really excited to share it uh, with, the, with the educators that I work with. Um, we have a common board configuration for you. We are going to be offering some professional development um, points for you today. Um, and it's important that we know about this information because children spend more time <laughs> with their classmates and teachers than they actually spend with their parents, you know, in their lifetime of, you know, through their academic career. And their experiences at school can either support their social emotional growth or it can be very detrimental to their social emotional growth. And so um, that's why I've made it part of my deliberate practice. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. And I also, of course, have our learning scale <laughs> as appropriate. We have everything from, I know everything there is to know about gender identity, gender diversity, um, and why they're an at-risk population, how they suffer discrimination to, I have no idea what we're talking about today and you know, need to know. Okay. okay. First of all, I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention that there are laws in place to protect these children, just like there are laws to protect against racial discrimination and religious discrimination. Um, the Florida statute that's posted there actually reads, um, we shall not harass or discriminate against any student on the basis of race, color, or religion, sex, age, national or ethnic origin, political beliefs, marital status, handicapping conditions, sexual orientation or identity, or social or family background and should make reasonable effort to assure that each student is protected from harassment or discrimination. Um, there's also civil rights laws in place. And um, you know what we have to realize as public educators, no matter what our personal beliefs and philosophies are, when we park the car, that stays. It stays there. And you walk in the door and you support all students. Um, it reminds me of when I've had parents ask me, 
if I'm a Christian psychologist. And I don't even know how to respond to that uh, because I, I have to say, well, what will I tell the next parent? Mm -hmm. You know, um, that may be asked me if I'm a you know, Hindu or... Right. Um, so it's um, very, very much, in, you know, in the public education, we have to leave all those, those personal beliefs outside. Okay. All right. I have an icebreaker activity, and there's some pencils and postcards on your table. And just for a minute, when I was doing the research, I thought of this. Um, it's just amazing. On one side of the card, if you can, just write a few words that would describe masculinity. Well, how would you describe your own words or definition of masculinity? And on the other side, describe femininity. We all have our own thoughts about that. And maybe you can see what my thoughts are with the, even the font that I chose to use to write those words. We're just gonna have you think about that and then set it to the side. We're going to come back to that later in the presentation. probably could be a whole presentation in itself. Mm -hmm. And when I first thought about what type of workshops I would you know, share with um, my schools this year, I, my first workshop I thought of was, oh, you know, I'm going to talk about how lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth are at risk for school dropout, academic failure, um, suicide um, risk. But then when I started researching that, I thought, I don't even know enough about gender variants to even talk about that yet. So that's why I decided to put this workshop together and say, well, let's talk about gender. It was just so much information about that and so, so much I was learning in the research. So I thought, okay, I need a slide about this. And then I thought, well, I need a whole bunch of slides to support this slide. <laughs> so this slide is the crux of our talk today. But I want to just kind of go around and discuss the terminology, and you have a handout that's really very helpful, I think. And I think just knowing the appropriate language to use and being aware of the language that we do use in front of our students is really important. At the top, biological sex. Simply, what are the external and internal biological features of the human? Does the person have a penis? Does the person have ovaries? And our society typically uses the penis to say they are male. If there's no penis, they say it's female. Then we use gender, boy or girl, to identify that person. When I was reading the research, I was even you know, saying to myself, when I interview boys and girls at the elementary school level, I always say, are you a boy or a girl? I'm asking children basic demographic information about themselves, and now I'm not even sure that that's an appropriate question. It's really starting to make me think about how I interact with very young people. I'm asking them their age, their date of birth, if they knew their phone number, are you a boy or girl? And now I'm thinking, how else? I need, to, I need to change the way I pose that question. Gender identity to the left, that is how someone feels their internal, psychological, and emotional identity. So maybe my biological sex at birth, I was told I was a male, but I identify as a female. I feel like a female. I identify 
and feel more feminine. Then down at the bottom, I have gender expression and orientation, and really I should have made two bubbles there. Gender expression is the visual presentation. How I, what I play, what I wear, the toys that I might choose, the sports that I want to participate in, and then gender orientation, there is your sexual orientation. Who do you think is hot? And I think that's an easy way to think about that. Who would you have romantic feelings toward? And that typically comes into play around 9 to 12 years of age. Believe it or not, your, in, your gender identity typically comes into play as early as two to three years of age. Mm -hmm. I feel like a girl, but they call me Carl. They tell me I'm a boy, but I feel like a girl. It's that early on in toddlerhood that you start developing that gender identity. The terminology can cross over. It comes a little confusing in your handout. What's important to understand that there's a term, gender non-conforming. Gender non-conforming. That means my gender identity may be different than my biological sex. That does not mean that I'm gay or lesbian or bisexual. Example, a female who wears sweatpants, running shorts, jeans, and sneakers, you've never seen her in any dress. She's a fireman. She played baseball in college, but she goes home to her husband and four children. She would be considered gender non-conforming heterosexual. Wow. You might see her on the street and you'd say, oh, you might assume she was a lesbian because she's gender non-conforming, but she's a heterosexual. You might see just the opposite. You may have very masculine males that you would never guess are gay. So it goes, it's vice versa, right? So just because you're gender non-conforming, you can't assume they're gay, and just because they're not, you can't assume they're heterosexual. So it's a it's a variance. And when I was growing up, they called that. I was one of those people that gender not conforming. I guess I like were talking about. They called those tomboys. Tomboys, and they mm -hmm. were called tomboys. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. a tomboy, and I was growing up. I was going to say, I think even my car represents a tomboy. I, yeah, I would never drive a little. Crappy little car, uh -huh. like a little bad people. No, it has to be a truck with a four wheel drive. Right. I'll get that done. <laughs> and you know, it's just like everything is, is a spectrum. Yeah. You know, what do you yeah. feel comfortable with? Exactly. I, I call myself a jeans and sneakers girl. Yeah, yeah. I love wearing jeans and sneakers. You know, it, it, there, but there's a yeah. spectrum. And that's, what, and that's what we have to consider yeah. even when we're working with children. And it's like even when a, a teacher says, separate yourselves between boys and girls. How does that make a gender variant child feel? Which group do they go to? And I think that might happen more in the elementary school years. Yeah, because I was just gonna say that's really language that could hurt. That's language that's hurt. That's hurt. Yeah, so yeah. they have to be careful and you yeah. know. So you know, a lot of people want to know how does this happen? Why does it happen? What causes it? We know what doesn't cause it. It's not parental beliefs or behaviors, it's not parenting practices, it's not the fight family dynamics there. There's no neglect or, you know, it's not because their parents were divorced. Um, some people have said, oh, it must have been the fertility drugs. No, that's <laughs> not it. <laughs> um, it's not because the mom wanted a boy, but she got a girl. Um, it, it's actually, it, there are true brain images that have shown there are differences in transgender people in the, in the parts of the brain that are typically different in male and females anyways. And they are very different. Mm -hmm. They are just gender variant. Mm -hmm. 
And it's just something that I think that it's not that we're going to have more identified, it's just that we're going to become more aware of this. And a lot of people maybe who have I've been identified as anxious, depressed, maybe an adjustment disorder during you know their middle school or high school ages, maybe truly this is the crux of the issue. And that's what I've seen. Children have come to my attention because of anxiety or depression, and really they have a gender identity obstacle <laughs> that you have to help them through. Because a lot of times they're not even quite sure what it what is. It is yeah. They're not quite sure what it is. But it's not pathological. And there's been a recent change in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, from what used to be referred to as a gender identity, identity disorder to gender dysphoria, which is basically just a discontent and feeling uneasiness with their gender identity, which leads to anxiety and depression, which is a much better description of really, truly what's happening. Thank you for joining us. We have some handouts over here, and if you want to sign in there for attending the workshop. Okay, let's move on. Okay, the transgender facts and risk factors. They're alarming. Wow. Um, the number nine there at the, at the top there, um, with our student population, if we had to estimate with 0.5 high school students self-identifying, we've approximately nine or 10 students on our campus. Wow. Um, this was taken from a survey of 300 transgender students that were surveyed ages 13 years of age and older. And these are the statistics that they got, that they received. Three times the national dropout rate, which is not good. 50% experience negative response from their families when they um, actually come to choose to tell them. And 26% are kicked out of their homes. And that I have seen. They have to live with family members, or our friends, friends, or our extended family that are more supportive. Is anyone surprised by those numbers? No. The self-identified, yes. I'm surprised that that's so low. Oh, really? And you know, that that um, survey was taken in 2001. Okay. So maybe, you know, we had, and that was like the national survey, they do that like every, you know, 10, um, 15 years, and that, that was the latest data that I had for that information. So, yeah, I think we are seeing um, much more Hopefully, students feel more comfortable with, yeah. with their, their, their gender. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to put some information here on gender and minorities because we serve a large minority population. 80% um, of white children come out to their parents versus 60% of minority children. Um, they're more likely to engage in risky sexual behaviors, drug and alcohol abuse, minority students are. Um, because they are not as easily accepted and they experience more negative sexual health outcomes because of that behavior. And they feel a lot more pressure to choose between the gay culture versus, you know, cultural, social, their own culture. And that's, of course, <clears throat> just some, some basic information there that I wanted to point out. So, protective factors. What can keep these children from experiencing those risk factors that we, you know, just displayed two slides back? Um, you know, resiliency is something that we just talked about you know, for, before you stepped in, ladies. We were talking about basically children need to have coping strategies. In a, a lot of children that come to us in the counseling setting, whether it's anxiety or depression or a gender identity obstacle that they're struggling with, you need to teach them basic coping strategies. And these are coping strategies that they'll use throughout their lifetime mm -hmm. in building the resiliency. You know, some children are just more naturally resilient, but it's not something that you can't acquire. You can learn to be resilient um, and have that, you know, positive self-concept so that, you know, things bounce off you a little bit easier. Or when you fall down, you get a little, you get up a little bit quicker and feel a little bit stronger. Um, as far as family acceptance goes, we don't really have too much 
control over that. Um, but what they're talking about is, you know, how well does the, ch the family allow the child to pick their own wardrobe? Um, do they display pictures of the child with their friends? And do they accept their preferred activities? Do they accept their preferred toys? Do they allow them to wear um, what they want to wear outside of the home or maybe just inside the home? Um, that's How do they let the child decorate their room? You know, things like that. Um, and in school, acceptance. Big time again, you know, just to remind you, they spend a lot of time with us, more time than with their parents. And, you know, we need to remember, we have these non-discrimination laws in place. And again, our personal beliefs cannot, you know, play a part in that. If we hear discriminating slurs and jokes, we really need to step in. No matter what we feel about it, no matter how we feel about it, it just really needs to be um, something that we support. Gender neutral bathrooms, that's a huge issue for teens, you know, um, dressing out. We have a girls locker room and a boys locker room. You know, if you have um, an identified <coughs> female at birth who feels more male, that would be FTM, it was a female to male. She was born, she was identified as a female on her birth certificate, but she feels more male. So she identifies herself as a male. She may not feel very comfortable with her body. Sometimes they self-mutilate in the literature that shows. And she may not even feel very comfortable with her breasts. She may, may not want to you know, dress out um, during you know, um, PE, physical education. She may self-mutilate during her period. Um, it's, it's, it's very involved in the literature, what you see, and just so many things to think about as far as what, what we do um, to support them on our campus, if we support them on our campus. Um, dances, some schools have uniforms, what you expect them to wear. Um, they suggest that you have a great gay straight alliance club on your, on your campus. Very few high schools do. We don't. And, you know, I know some administrators are not in support of that. We're lucky that we have a, a Mr. Hepburn that's in, in, in support of putting something together like that. Okay. Here are some questions. Um, oh, no, that's the next slide. Um, I think just building some awareness and educating ourselves on what gender diversity is and gender variance. Um, here's some keys to um, what we can do on our campus. I mentioned the book that I read, The Transgender Child. It actually re uh, recommends that there be a gender development um, curriculum that's built into a social emotional curriculum, you know, from pre-K on. But I don't really truly believe that OCPS even has a good social emotional curriculum at all, but if they did, that gender identity itself, just gender identity should be a part of that, so that if we have a policy not to discriminate, our children should embrace that policy not to discriminate. But if they don't even understand what we're asking them to not discriminate about, how can we ask them to support it? Our parents need to be told not to discriminate. You know, there's a yes ma'am. And we need to model it. And we need to model it. Right, so it's not just, and it's not just us. It's the school bus drivers. It's the lunchroom ladies. It's the custodians. It's the security people. It's everybody. It needs to be, you know, the non-discrimination laws need to be posted and they need to be talked about at the beginning of every school year. And it's not just for gender variant children. It's for everybody. Everyone. It's just a non-discrimination practice for respect for others. Um, but it, it, that's why they're suggesting it be just a part of something that we talk about every day. Now here are the questions that I wanted to ask everyone just to ask themselves. And I'm in no way <laughs> suggesting that you don't do these things, but I myself, again, to remind you, I chose this topic because I know I needed to develop skills in this area. So just you know, go down those questions and ask, is there maybe an area where you could make improvements in your classroom or in your daily practice and interacting with students? And are there
there areas where we can improve? Perhaps we need more books, more literature, more movies that show gender diversity. Perhaps we need to be more aware of the language that we use in the classroom. I know when I've been reading literature, I know that there's things, like I said, like in my interviews with young people, are you a boy or a girl? I need to change that. So I know that there's areas where I need to improve. What would you change that to? Because you know, I am, you know, where I'm at. And you know, I, I think, well, with, a, with an older child, you could say, you know, what, what do you, what's your gender identity or? They're not gonna understand that question though. And but we need to use the language so they become used to the language right. and understand it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that opens the door to speaking about it. Right, and what do you mean, and then you explain it. Or, and there, there are forms that Orange County has, because I've seen them at my elementary school, it's like, what does your child like to be called? That's a start, right? you know, and we do have some differences there. You know, what do you like to be called, you know? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I haven't come up with how I'm going to change my interview. Are you a boy or a girl um, for the little ones? Right. And a lot of times I ask that just because I want to know, you know, I'm looking at, you know, like very low functioning kids. But now I'm thinking, I really do need to approach that differently. Because what if I'm making a child feel uncomfortable right. with that question? So those are just some thoughts for us, you know, and where we might be able to improve. Now, let's go back to our icebreaker. Okay, and our icebreaker for those of you who just joined us, I had the ladies on one side of the card write their definition of masculinity, and on the other side of the card, femininity. How would you describe that? So if you can take a second just to kind of think about how you would, and then maybe share with each other what you wrote. And the reason why I wanted you to do that is because when I was reading the literature, I thought, gosh, you know, I'm reading this and I, I have these, you know, ideas about what I think is masculine. And, and if you could go back, well, I'll, I'll, I'll flip back to how I even wrote the words, you can mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. what my idea is. And to give you a little bit of news, my daughter's pregnant. Hey. I'm going to be a grandma. I'm going to be a grandma. grandma. But we're already talking about how the room's going to be decorated. <laughs> right? Because if it's a girl, it's going to look one way. If it's a boy, it's going to be looking one uh -huh. way. And how much you want to bet when we find out if it's a girl, we're even going to talk to the baby in the womb a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's a boy, it's going to be, hey, how you doing, buddy? And if it's a girl, we'll be like, oh, Right? So it's just interesting how we interact with something that's not even with us yet. <laughs> and it's almost difficult to find gender neutral infant clothes nowadays. Very gender specific <laughs> baby sections in the stores. So it really got me thinking about what we do to children. Okay, does anyone want to share what they wrote about that? For boy, I put hair muscle attitude. Well, listen to what you just said. You said for boy. Uh, not masculine. <laughs> now, I could be a girl with female parts and have masculine features. Uh -huh. So it's interesting that you said boy. When I said, write down what you consider masculine. Right? So that's interesting in itself. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so then let's continue. <laughs> oh, it's just interesting, right? No, because it's just it's embedded in us. It's embedded in us. Yeah. Did anyone have anything similar or very different? I have similar muscles. I, I guess the male organs, but I also have how males present themselves different from females, such I as. Could it be that they're less? Know, could, could be. Sometimes there's a macho thing that we'll know about, and then a the woman will have a sensitive side, but at the same time, if you're talking about gender, that person could have that sensitive side, and they're a guy. So. Right. There's gentlemen. Yes. 
then there's and there's tough women. Yes. You know, like there's women that are in the armed forces mm -hmm. that are in battle, and I and I think to myself, how can they do that? Mm -hmm. They must be tough as nails. Twenty years ago, when I lived in New York City, um, me, um, um, females um, went to the union because they wanted to be firefighters. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to be garbage people. And if you ever lived in New York, you know, when it comes to those apartments, the the garbage that they have to pick up is like a mile long. Mm -hmm. Some bags that they don't think they were physically able to do it. But they were strong. But it was a big fight with the firefighters who would say, fine, let them come if they could pick up a hose that weighs, when the water hit it, then hey, they're on their own. You know, they were really going back at them and I said, oh, wow. Let them try if they want. Why, why try to reject them? Right. And the garbage guys were saying, well, I hope they could handle all of the cats that are, the, all the, 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 the rats that are as big as cats. And I'm good, but why? If they want to do it. <laughs> Lori, I'm a you? tomboy, but I'm a girl. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Lori, what did you have? Strong, powerful, and in charge. Sherman. Powerful and in charge. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. And, ah. and the vets for both. But yeah. and see, and it's interesting. Yes. But you say you know you probably know some women who are strong, powerful, and in I charge. I am. I'm oh, one yeah. Right you home. know it. Mm -hmm. And what do you have for femininity? Delicate strength and love. Mm. <laughs> so she has strength in there for women too. That's <laughs> interesting. Okay, so ask ourselves these questions. Do students feel accepted and safe on our campus? And if you ask the student randomly in the hall today whether or not they heard a gender identity or gender orientation slur just today, yeah. oh, yeah. what would they say? Yes. Yes. Of course. And I think so too. I think they may have heard more than one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We really need to start educating from the womb to be more sensitive and to be politically correct and, and uh, just humanly correct. Humanly correct. And, you know, accepting, just yeah. accepting people who they are. The acceptance is not there. I mean, just like finally the acceptance of the marriage. Here. Yeah, today is it's interesting <laughs> that today is I know. Oh, right. So it says where to begin. It says practice zero tolerance. You know, discipline should be the same across the board. It doesn't know it doesn't matter who you're dealing with. You know, the the feeling safe and the non discrimination laws cross for everyone. We need to model, like you said, model acceptance for diversity. Um, we need to infuse some transgender and gender diverse materials into our classroom because it exists. And so they would feel supported. Provide them with resources. I have additional resources um, that I've come across since I even put the PowerPoint together. If you want additional information, please ask. Provide positive role models. We have role models on our campus. We're very, very lucky. Um, be an adult and not a friend. And, and I hope no one takes that offensively, but sometimes, you know, I see a lot of interactions. And sometimes, you know, I have to catch myself too. You know, when children come to us to talk, they need an adult. They have friends. Hmm. <laughs> they have friends. When they're coming to you for support, it's because they need you to be the adult. They need your guidance. Um, and if you can't provide it, you know, there are lots of resources on your campus or someone who can find the guidance for them. Now, what if you are having this conversation with a student, you know, they bring it up, whatever, however the case is brought up, um, and they're not comfortable or they don't like what you said. They go back home and tell their parent what they didn't like. You know, how is that backed up for us? Do you know what I'm saying? You know, I would document, I, I try to document all my interactions with all students, and as long, I always remind myself, and you should remind yourself this too, if you are constantly working in the best interest of a child, and you truly believe what you're doing and saying is in the best interest of the child, nothing's going to happen to you, Priscilla. Right. Okay? Yeah. What you do need to do is remember, you leave your personal beliefs and philosophies Correct. outside. Correct. You provide them with information, acceptance, and support. Mm -hmm. 
right? right? What is it that that person could not like? And you know what? If you said something they didn't like, maybe they needed to hear it. Yeah, true. And if the parent doesn't like it, then he can come in, he or she can come in and talk to us about it. Right. But if you are always acting in the best interest of a child, no judge is going to punish you for that. Okay. Okay? That's well, the, the only circumstance might be where you're saying it's okay to feel these things, and the parent is saying and no, it is. but it's it not. Is. But the parent is saying no, it's not okay. So there you're going to have conflict. Because then the there's a conflict. But is she wrong? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's okay to feel any way you want. No one can dictate someone's feelings. Right. It is okay to feel that way. Okay. No one can tell anyone how to feel. And if you have a problem with that, you bring the parent in and me and I'll back you up. And then my boss can get mad at me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You right. can feel any way you want. No one can tell anyone how to feel. Because you're not telling the child how to feel. They're no parent can tell me. They're just saying what how they feel. What can you do? Right. You know, sometimes, yeah. and at the rate of, it's funny that you're talking about that because, you know, I was listening to something this morning about the same kind of thing and at the risk that you were talking about with suicide and things. Sometimes they are saying this thing just to hear something positive from somebody. Right. It's okay. And I accept you. And you, you don't know what is that fear they're suffering. You know, to take their life because it's so much. What can you say? Yeah. Um, I have, this is my last slide, it's just some resources, and I, like I said, I have additional resources. Um, the librarian was very um, helpful in providing some additional resources for our students. They're on that table that are there for checkout, and um, please let me know if I can be of further assistance. And on the whiteboard there, if you have suggestions for future workshops, I would love to hear your ideas. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.